Okay. Um, I might get underway with our initial um, announcements. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai. Welcome everyone. My name is Paulette Wallace and I am a member of the Our Common Dignity Rights-Based Approaches Working Group. Um, we'd like you to please enter your full real name into the Zoom. Uh, so if there are any Steve's iPhones or Sierra's computer, we'd really appreciate it if you included your full name instead of those iPhones or computer names. Now please mute your microphones and we may mute your microphones if we have any disruption during uh, the webinar. And to lessen the disruptions, it would be great if you could switch off your video um, if you need to be doing other things. We would, we would like to receive your questions and comments, so please feel free to type these into the Zoom chat um, and let us know what you're thinking. And please note that all questions and comments from today's webinar will be collated by the Our Common Dignity Rights-Based Approaches Working Group, and that today's webinar is also being recorded, and so we're on Facebook Live, uh, but also the Zoom recording will be available at a later time on the ICMOS YouTube channel, and uh, we will provide links and more information about that when that is available. And we would like to know what you think about our webinar. So all feedback helps us to improve, and we'll be posting links to our um, evaluation poll that we have during the webinar, and these links will be in the Zoom chat. So you just need to click on that and take a few moments to fill in our 15 questions. It would be very much appreciated because that assists us to develop what we provide. Now, this is our agenda for today. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce Rin Alatulu, and she is also a member of the Our Common Dignity Rights-Based Approaches Working Group for ICOMOS, but also the ICOMOS uh, Vice President for Europe. Yes, uh, thank you, Paulette. Uh, I'm here to um, uh, open the section of news because on each Heritage Thursday, we have a news uh, part. And uh, this time we are, as we are living the hard times with the war in Europe and almost in the world, world, world uh, uh, Ecomos Europe Group and um, uh, Ecomos Poland organized a huge uh, seminar uh, dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention's uh, achievements and challenges in Europe. But uh, as the war is going on, uh, the huge part of this um, conference was dedicated to Ukraine. And uh, now we are going to show you a video with uh, uh, a collection of statements on, on the issue. The aim of our conference is primarily to discuss and reflect on the achievements of the 1972 Convention concerning protection of the world culture and natural heritage, assess the success of the UNESCO World Heritage List, but also consider challenges that lie ahead. Some challenges are unprecedented, as we have recently learned in the context of the war in Ukraine. And we were planning this conference. We did not expect that it would take on a completely different context after February 24th. The unprecedented attack by Russia on independent Ukraine and the deliberate destruction of its cultural heritage is a situation that requires uh, us to review many of our actions so far. Uh, earlier in June, the Minister of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine, Ale Alexander Kachenko informed about over uh, 370 destroyed heritage sites, almost half of which are, are churches of various denominations. Literally, a few days ago, All Saints Shrine in the village of uh, Tetyanivka was bombed and burned. 
The destruction of Kharkiv remains the most poignant uh, symbol of this war. This is why we have uh, included in the conference program a special session, uh, a special session dedicated uh, uh, to the endangered heritage of Ukraine. Uh, you may know that many people uh, have lost their houses, uh, they have lost their jobs, and uh, have lost any access to normal life. Uh, when we are talking about a uh, city like Mariupol or Chernigiv or Kharkiv, we understand that uh, a huge number of buildings are destroyed. We understand that uh, thousand objects of cultural heritage are destroyed. Uh, we have uh, now a database when we uh, have uh, verified up to 400 objects, but it's not all the picture. And we understand that we do not have a clear information for now, for example, about archaeological sites and many, many other objects in the cities and small and large cities or villages uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine, for example, which is not accessible, uh, which are not accessible for us now. Uh, we understand that many people uh, who are uh, devoted their lives to the cultural heritage protection or museum work or other very important sphere uh, even uh, do not have any possibilities to return to their uh, work because they do not have uh, an access for their collections or archives or other institution and uh, institutional uh, capacities. And uh, uh, they uh, just uh, feel very, uh, even not sad, I even do not have uh, enough word for it. Uh, they understand that they lost everything. And that is why we are now uh, understand that not only the cultural heritage objects are vulnerable, but also people. And everything is start from people. Uh, we must support uh, our people in the, our sphere and our field as much as possible, because uh, without people, without network, we, uh, we can do nothing. And all the plans, uh, all the plans for evacuation, or the plans for protecting some objects could be just destroyed in one minute, because the rocket hits the museum, or the rocket hits the uh, archive, as it was happened in Chernigiv, or the rockets uh, hit the building where the museum professionals live. And unfortunately, we do not have any safe place in Ukraine now. The country itself uh, do not have uh, enough resistance and do not have enough resources to, uh, to stop uh, all the things which are going on on the, our fire line. Uh, it's a dynamic situation and we must uh, reload our brains and reload our, uh, even reload our feelings just not to go uh, sometimes not to go emotionally uh, to make the right decisions. We must unfortunately learn and pay very high price for these lessons. And we must do everything we can to, uh, to stop uh, these awful things which happen uh, with Ukrainian cities, with Ukrainian cultural heritage objects and uh, with our people. We must maybe rethink uh, also some international rules uh, for example, the effectiveness and the real instrument of implementations of conventions. Because as we see, uh, the conventions even could be ratified, but uh, it will um, just cancelled by the steps uh, made by army of another country. Our country just not to be existed in the brain of some people who decided to start the war. So, if you do not have your country, you do not have your nations, you do not have your cultural heritage, you destroyed your identity, identity. And it is the war against identity and against humanity. And we uh, are ready to share this experience, to make these new rules uh, together for better protection of our common heritage and our people and professionals all around the world. The nowadays world is characterized by many significant and fast-growing threats to people and to their cultural heritage worldwide. We had just the testimony of our colleague, uh, man, uh, Madam uh, Katerina Shuyeva. Um, our world is facing ecological, economical and social crisis that is now manifesting itself in a global scale global warming, scarcity of natural resources, 
uh, deforestation, a drastic loss of biodiversity, natural and industrial disasters, conflicts and wars. In order to succeed and to face uh, today and tomorrow crisis, current metholo methodologies need to be adapted and readjust. We need to improve governance of disaster risk reduction and resilience to support the achievements of the sustainable development goals. And here I profit to tell dear Catherine, uh, I reassure you of the support of ECOMAS, not only of European group, not only of Poland, but uh, e-commerce as a whole. We are here with you, we help you, and I'm sure we can help mutually because we have also a lot of things to learn from you. Uh, let me read the uh, quotation from the book that was published after our conference in 1995, and those um, quotations from the um, paper of Professor Krzysztof Pawłowski, um, duties to heritage and human rights. The protection of our heritage requires joint action at the both national and international level, levels. It will become possible thanks to the progress in the education of young people. The concept of solidarity must manifest itself through the awareness that we have obligations not only to our own heritage, but also to the heritage of others. This is particularly important as we live in a time when armed conflicts threaten not only the lives of women, men and children, but also the heritage that is a testimony to their identity. Therefore, it seems necessary to us to include a paragraph in the draft of the Charter of Heritage Rights, stating that deliberate destruction of cultural heritage undertaken for ideological, political or, or ethnic reasons will be treated as a violation of human rights and in extreme cases as a crime against humanity. Excellent. Um, I think thank you very much for, for the, the ECOMOS team for, for sharing that, that insights about, about the work also to respond to contemporary challenges taking place in, in Ukraine, uh, the war there, and at the same time also showing how the, the importance of a human rights based framework actually to, 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 to respond to this from the heritage community. Um, Rin, do you want to say a couple of ending notes on the, in this respect? <laughs> Yeah, uh, e-commerce Europe group uh, made a statement um, uh, for um, uh, for for the sake of the heritage in Ukraine and also involving uh, the questions of uh, rights in uh, the rights and uh, in in the process of the hopefully soon re starting recovery in uh, in Ukraine. And we are still uh, working on uh, on issues uh, with uh, not not still working on, but we continue working uh, our cooperation with our colleagues in in Ukraine, and hopefully we will have uh, some more news in uh, in near future on the uh, development of the of this work. All right. In, in this case, let let me then uh, take over. Uh, Peter Larson, I'm 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 been invited to chair this session, and I'm very honored and thankful and grateful to the organizers for for this opportunity. Um, I would like to again. The context here is the 50th year anniversary of the World Heritage Convention, and and fundamentally. When I started preparing for this event and discussing with Paulette, uh, the real question is, of course, where are we standing after 50 years on issues related to community and rights issues? Um, and in a sense, it's not just the 50th anniversary. If you think about it, it's also the 15th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention actually adopting community as, as a strategic objective. It's the 10 year anniversary, more or less, of the advisory bodies really stepping up their action and, and starting to work on community and, and human rights issues more substantially. It's seven years down the line from, from the World Heritage Committee adopting a sustainable development policy with clear 
uh, normative commitments in the field of human rights, community benefit sharing, participation, et cetera. So what I wanted to you know, insist upon with this community that we've gathered here today is that you know, not just celebrate these dates, but actually show how there's been an evolution and also a, an increased, at least policy-wise commitment. And finally, and, and uh, we'll get back to that in a second, it's also the fifth year anniversary of the World Heritage Committee actually recognizing and inviting uh, the participation of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on World Heritage, with whom we have the chair here today, Chrissy Grant, who's our keynote, and I'll get back to that in a second. So for me, these are all very important dates to, to take into account, but fundamentally, this of course leaves us with three basic questions. Is the World Heritage Convention and the committee and the institution around it, are we doing enough and are we doing the right things to actually address community and rights issues? So that's, that's sort of the bigger one that, that I'm, I also throw out there to all the panelists. But what I'm also really uh, you know, happy about is to see such a strong group of panelists here where we can learn from. So for me, that question is, what, what can we actually learn from, from specific cases of, of trying to do good, learning from good practice, but conversely also, what can we learn where things are going wrong? And the final question is, what can we actually learn from engagement in the international sphere? And this is also something I believe that we'll be addressing with our keynote in a second. So really, there, there are a number of big questions here. How are we doing? And what can we actually learn from what we're doing? In this respect, uh, there's been a lot of, of discussion recently in the news. We've heard about evictions of thousands of indigenous Maasai in, in, in Morongoro area, in, in Lolondio as well. So really the questions here are, what can we learn from these cases that seemingly are going wrong? And, and how can we address those cases much better? Um, I, I, I quote here also a statement recently from Loliondo Maasai elders who are living in, in the buffer zone of Serengeti and outside of the Morongoro area as well asking how can it be that we possessed and protected this land for millennia and this sacred link is in danger to disappear from Tanzania's history in merely 60 years. So we're dealing with deep structural fundamental challenges. And the question is indeed, how do we go about it? And I'm extremely pleased here also that we have uh, participants and panelists from the Maori and from the, the New Zealand context, from the Australian Aboriginal context, also really to speak into how to deal with these processes of recognition, of restitution, of reconciliation. Um, and in this sense, it also, in, in fact, leads me to the, the saying, we have the learning from the specific cases. And I think the event here is fantastic to do that again. Thank you so much to the Oricom and Dignity Rights-Based Group for, for organizing this. Um, but also uh, with our keynote, uh, Ms. Chrissy Grant, uh, uh, it'll be extremely interesting to also get a perspective from the International Indigenous Peoples Forum. As I mentioned, five years of existence what can we learn from these kind of institutional forms of engagement with indigenous peoples and their rights in the context of world heritage? So with those words, I believe my time is up and it's, it's a privilege and honor to, to, to present you, Chrissy. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to list all the things that, that you're doing. I would like to just underline two. I've already mentioned you're the chair of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on World Heritage. You're also the chair of uh, Wet Tropics Management Authority Board of Directors. So I think, you know, you have all the legitimacy and interest. And of course, we've known each other for quite a bit, a long history and engagement on these issues. Thank you so much for accepting to, to be the keynote on this and the floor is yours. Thank you. Take myself off mute. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, hopefully everybody can see that. Everyone can see that? Yep. Oh, that's fantastic. I can see you too. Um, okay, so um, as Peter said, uh, I am the chair of the, um, we call it the Peoples, the Indigenous Peoples Forum uh, as a shorter version of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum for World Heritage. Um, and I, I suppose I've been at that since um, 
all. It's I've got a little timetable in there, so uh, uh, let's go and have a look. So what I wanted to actually talk about was the Indigenous people's engagement in World Heritage and looking at the forum. We've only been operating at the World Heritage Committee meeting since 2019. And then we had uh, the interruption of COVID and we've been virtual ever since. So um, we just have to wait and see how the 2022 um, version comes out. Um, but also that I've been involved in our uh, common dignity um, initiatives um, in uh, meetings over in Oslo, Norway, um, and they were supported by uh, Norway, ICMAS Norway. Um, and so I've, I found it very interesting that, um, you know, sort of when that put, report was put together and presented to um, the World Heritage Committee in 2016. So I just wanted to pick up on a few things and how we're going with that, particularly looking at the rights-based approach, um, and uh, looking at uh, free prior informed consent, but also referring to the CBD with Articles 8J for uh, tradi traditional knowledge and 10C for customary sustainable use, and that they are now incorporating FPIC in a lot of their targets. Um, we've just finished a meeting in Nairobi last week. Um, not that I could get there, um, but that's another story. Also looking at research priorities for some reason where Indigenous peoples live um, on national parks, and that, and that includes my own group of people in the Eastern Cook and Yalanji, um, in Cape York, in the Daintree National Park. Uh, we have never left that um, park. We have always lived there. Yes, certainly there were people that were taken as part of the stolen generation, but for, you know, for reasons of, you know, sort of what is in the park, we are highly researched. Our plants, our animals and our peoples are highly researched peoples here in Australia. And so we, you know, sort of move into what um, partners, sort of parts, partnerships we can go into, um, particularly looking at the security and safeguarding of information. And um, then, uh, you know, the best practice of protocols and guidelines that are around, um, not only domestically for, for myself, but uh, for ourselves here in Australia, but certainly at the international level as well. So the, um, just, I just give you a quick background. Um, it went to uh, Krakow in Poland in uh, July, 2017, that there should be some sort of a, a body for indigenous peoples to have a voice at the World Heritage Committee meetings and you know, all the other processes and forums that they hold. Um, and it was modelled on the uh, UN Convention of Biological Diversity um, uh, and the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change mo models for Indigenous Peoples Forums. And I belong to the uh, the uh, the national um, sorry the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, and I've been with the uh, working with the Convention of Biological Diversity since 2012. Um, so when I went to, uh, even though I, I've been engaged in, in World Heritage domestically and, um, you know, sort of uh, locally, because I have two World Heritage properties that is across my traditional lands. The wet tropics, um, which goes right down to the reef, and that's where the, the rainforest meets the reef. And the, of course, then the Great Barrier Reef as well. Uh, so I've been engaged from a local level right through to the international level. Our purpose was to provide a platform um, for uh, being the voice uh, of the Indigenous peoples that, that don't really have a voice and that can't get the, to these meetings and forums to represent their own concerns and issues. Um, and we support those people by having, you know, sort of um, intercession meetings with them about their concerns and that. Um, and, you know, Peter and I were just talking about um, Tanzania and we're just waiting for word that where we can get involved in that. Um, but we, uh, uh, you know, so also engage with the World Heritage Committee, the advisory bodies and the centre, and um, we hope to have a good relationship there. And this is from the 2019 Baku um, meeting. We ran two back-to-back -back, 
um, side event, which was chock a block full. Um, this is giving statements, um, you know, interjecting and in statements. And it's only where the people want us to, to come in and speak on their behalf. And this is a steering committee members, um, and there's probably one missing, and here she is sitting here. So we're trying to get representatives from each of the regions. We have some core principles. I'm not going to go right through them all, but they are very important in that this is how we believe that we will, um, you know, sort of like to interact with Indigenous communities, um, also interact with, you know, the World Heritage Committee, the centre and the advisory bodies. So um, that's sharing information and making sure that, you know, sort of the capacity is being built uh, within communities to be able to take on different things or increase their skills um, and information um, about the processes of World Heritage listing and management and conservation. Then we have some rules for procedure of how we would like to uh, comply with obligations uh, to the uh, Indigenous peoples and members of the traditional communities and that's recognising and protecting their rights across lands, territories and resources, and also consulting with them and obtaining their free prior informed consent, respecting and protecting their traditional knowledge and practices in relation to the conservation and sustainable use of their lands, territories and resources, and ensuring that they fairly and equitably share the benefits from activities relating to such things. We get support, oh, there's Clemens, how are you? <laughs> but we get support from wide and, and far afield, um, not only from UNESCO, but also from the Canadian Embassy who supported us to put on the uh, side events. And um, Australia has been very supportive of me being in this role and other governments have been supporting their, the other members as well. So what do we have? I'm going to talk now about, you know, sort of what it is that we have and, um, you know, sort of how that marries up with Indigenous Peoples Forum. So we have um, the convention, of course. We have the operational guidelines. We have Indigenous engagement policy that we can talk about later because I, I'm not sure that it's being fully implemented. We have a cultural pro uh, policies and the report to the World Heritage of the, our common dignity, uh, the one I spoke about earlier, um, and advisory bodies to the World Heritage Committee. And our goal is to be an effective additional advisory body on Indigenous issues that are raised at the World Heritage level. Um, we believe this because it is hard to um, um, teach people about spirituality and connection to country where there are cultural values right across the landscape, tangible and intangible. So you'd have a landscape with mountains and hills and that, and, you know, sort of valleys, but there's a story that goes right through that. And sometimes there are song lines and it's really hard to try and teach people, you know, sort of that you have to look at it from a different set of lens. Uh, to understand fully the Indigenous people's connection and obligation to caring for country or caring for land. So we are the voice, um, as I said, for um, Indigenous peoples in the process and we use the, pr the principles and the articles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We were launched at COM 20, uh, 42 in Bahrain in 2018. As I said before, the, the um, Baku meeting um, at for, COM 43 was the first time that we had, um, you know, sort of been physically involved and present at World Heritage Committee meetings. So, you know, sort of we didn't have a rush on, but people, uh, we were getting the information out there that uh, Indigenous peoples were understanding that we were there, that we could make an inter interjection um, on their behalf. Um, and we go to forums um, and uh, meetings and that uh, between, uh, you know, sort of the, the World Heritage Committee meetings representing the, you know, sort of the, the rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, out of session or, or between sessions, we, we work with different uh, communities 
And, um, you know, sort of really it's about highlighting the abuse of human rights across these parks. And we all know what's been happening in some of these um, national parks that are now on the World Heritage Committee um, or are fighting to either put it on or keep it off until such times as they have the right processes in place, such as FPIC and such as rights-based um, uh, policies. And we provided submission to the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Rights in 2022 last year. And so what have we learned since 2016? I've picked out five of the 11 lessons learned from the Our Common Dignity um, uh, report. And the state parties experience, yes, they might have some, you know, they might be, possess experience, but it's not been demonstrated on the ground. Otherwise there would not be uh, so many of these atrocities that's happening with indigenous peoples um, around the, the globe. Human rights and people-centered approaches, UNESCO and the state parties need to be more proactive in this space. Professionals and rights, there, there needs to be more engagement of keen professionals in this, in this space. Diversity of frameworks works, more revision needs to be done on the operational guidelines. We've gotten some distance, but we still need to go all the way. Long-term action, need to get more conscious about what's happening on the ground and adhere to putting mechanisms in place to address human rights, particularly for the most vulnerable peoples living in on or near World Heritage properties. And what we know, well, that we know that we've got a duty of care um, of, and the well-being of our fellow human beings, but it doesn't look like that's being put into practice. As the original peoples across the world, Indigenous peoples are part of the landscape, as I mentioned before, and we have, you know, sort of respect for lands, territories and resources with traditional obligations to uphold their continuing cultures and that we need to come together to effectively fix the processes that will encourage and empower Indigenous peoples to effectively participate in world heritage processes. And so there's a number of things that needs to be changed. The operational guidelines to be fully revised, effective impl implementation of the UNESCO policies and operational guidelines. Um, and I bring those two up because um, we have made statements at the World Heritage Committee meetings about the, the lack of following, um, you know, those guidelines that allows Indigenous peoples to have um, the right to have a say. Um, incorporating human rights and social equity as part of the OUV third pillar of protection and management. Let's call a spade a spade. You know, don't do something and then call it something else. If it's a spade, it's a spade. The world needs compassion for our fellow human beings. And we just heard before about the, what's happening in um, uh, Ukraine and, you know, we don't need wars. We need to apply that duty of care for people's well-being that are all part of the landscape and accept that the atrocities directed towards Indigenous peoples are not acceptable. Um, also accept that economic gain for state parties is often considered over cons conservation preservation of the OUVs and accepting that there is little or no benefit going back to Indigenous uh, people's communities. So we need to accept that this needs to change and something is done to address the, this injustice for Indigenous peoples. So the, the benefits for Indigenous peoples are capacity building, giving them the opportunity to share knowledge and, and you know, learn from others. Um, networking, you know, it, it's really important that Indigenous peoples can network through a forum or, um, you know, sort Sorry, of- Sorry, Chris, uh, you have one minute to wrap up. Thanks. Oh, wow. Um, and empowerment, the, uh, the opportunity for Indigenous peoples to work uh, to World Heritage Properties to demonstrate their leadership at national and international levels. Let's share the load a little. And, um, you know, many, many issues are experienced on a property by property, but maybe it could, something could be done better in that area and influencing policy to enable greater participation by um, Indigenous peoples, sorry, that should be, uh, in the life of their respective properties and enabling Indigenous communities to meet their responsibilities for lands, territories and resources enhancing of their cultures. 
So these, these have actually come out of um, the, the report or it's a summary of, of that report coming together. As I said, um, in 2014, I was involved in the Oslo workshops. FPIC should be uh, there to address intellectual property, copyright and data management issues as well. Those things are quite often forgotten. Um, and it's important that Indigenous peoples maintain the, their right um, to own their intellectual property. Um, and sadly, on reflection, that there wasn't a concerted uh, focus on traditional knowledge and intellectual property rights at that time. But if there's those same discussions happen today, it might be a very different result from what happened ten, five to 10 years ago. So I might stop there because it's, um, it, it, I think I've covered the most of it, even though I haven't quite got through my presentation, but that's what I really wanted to say about um, rights-based approach and the International Indigenous Peoples Forum. Wonderful, Chrissy. Many thanks and indeed uh, apologies for having to interrupt due to, to the big group we have around the table here. I think I uh, were extremely impressive and, and I just want to say what the kinds of changes you're calling for towards uh, the, the, the duty of, of care um, and calling a spade in a spade and, and uh, accepting these changes. If, in, 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 if I, I, I'm to ask you one quick question, long question potentially, but what what do you see as the, the, the sort of three priorities from your side for, for getting to that change today? Um, look, I, I think it's important that Indigenous peoples are engaged in um, developing, designing, developing and delivering of anything that impacts on their lives. And so if they're whatever it might be, guidelines of how to, you know, sort of deal with um, and work with, in partnership and collaboration with Indigenous peoples, that they should be at the table from the very beginning. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and and in, in terms of how the, the International Forum is working, what do you see as, as, as priority ways of supporting the Forum to be even stronger than it is today? Yes, we don't get any support from anyone, UNESCO or any, um, you know, sort of country other than, uh, as I said, Australia supports me um, and um, to, be, to take on the role and to be active in this space. So, um, you know, the, we're all voluntary uh, or, you know, sort of mainly voluntary and sometimes it's part of the work of the people in the steering committee, um, but other, other times, you know, they have other jobs, they have full-time job and then this is just theirs their, you know, sort of passion and their hobby. So if, you know, state parties were to come to the party, if you like, um, and, you know, sort of have a, a contribution um, for uh, a vulnerable group of people that, you know, sort of really need to be at that table, um, you know, sort of, uh, we would welcome any sort of partnership that we could, and that would, it, would serve us both, um, uh, to, to, you know, sort of have that, that discussion with them. Thank you. I think that's an extremely important conclusion to take after having a, uh, a committee decision five years ago to set this up. And we need to, to make sure that the, the flows of energy resources and, and, and support is there to make, to really make you build up on, on that in, enormous effort and voluntary effort that you're also putting into this. So how to make this work? I mean, clearly the issues out there are huge and, 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 and deserve a much more substantive way of being addressed. Thank you for that, uh, Chrissy. I think that was an extremely powerful keynote, which now allows me to even stick to the time schedule uh, and move on to, to the next uh, segment in this event which the organizers considered really an opportunity to learn from perspectives, uh, uh, grounded perspectives on opportunities and challenges uh, for communities and indigenous peoples uh, in, in three sites that, uh, that are engaging differently with world heritage, um, or at least are different sort of stages preparing or, or long, long established and so on. Uh, we're gonna start moving um, to, to the, home of the Maori uh, to New Zealand. Uh, and, um, and, and it's a great pleasure to present Connie Norgate uh, from the Department of Conservation. And indeed, 
learn from this emblematic case of Tongariro, which really has played a key role actually also in the history of, of the World Heritage Convention to get indigenous people's issues on the ground, but also ha has gone through its own set of issues. So um, <clears throat> very happy. Thank you again, Connie, for, for joining this conversation and the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Tēnā tato katoa. Greetings to you all from Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's a pleasure to join you today. Um, please excuse me, I do have a wee cough, so if I start spluttering, it won't last for very long, and I apologise in advance. Uh, next slide, please, Paulette. Uh, so Tongariro National Park is one of three World Heritage Sites in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The other two being to Waiponamu in the southwest of New Zealand and the sub-Antarctic islands. These three sites are our share of some of the most remarkable places in the world. Next slide, please. Oh, yep. Uh, Tongariro National Park was inscribed as a World Heritage Site under natural criterion one and three in December, 1990. That was in recognition of the outstanding natural landscapes from both a geological and ecological perspective. Next slide, please. The cultural criterion was not considered to be met at the time, however, was awarded in 1993 after negotiation to include sites where the cultural association was intangible. The cultural aspect for the Māori people exists in the spiritual connection they have between their people and the land. At this point, Tongariro was the first World Heritage Site to gain dual World Heritage status. Next slide, please. Opportunities. As the tribes of Tongariro negotiate settlement with the Government of New Zealand under the Treaty of Waitangi, they will likely seek to manage Tongariro National Park in the future. For those of you that are not aware, the Treaty of Waitangi is New Zealand's founding document. It was an agreement signed by the Māori chiefs and the British Crown in 1840. Another opportunity is for Māori and state party to co-design management tools that speak to the intangible values. This has already been tested in the tourism sector where co-design of tools to determine appropriate visitor numbers at significant and special sites is underway. Next slide, please. And for the challenges, <clears throat> while not fully understood for us yet, climate change impacts could range from impacting tourism and economic prosperity for surrounding communities to severe weather patterns impacting the natural landscape. Another challenge is prescribing future outcomes or sites before treaty settlement for Tongariro National Park is completed. This has been relevant when trying to prescribe the statement of outstanding universal value for cultural heritage. Māori may not wish to go into this level of detail before the agreement with the Crown has been reached. Next slide, please. That's the end of my part of the presentation, but uh, we'll now watch a pre-recorded message from Tanahi Waniko, who will share some of the cultural context from a Māori perspective. I'm then happy to take questions after that. <coughs> no reira. Yahu mai tēnei i rungi i tahau matau e pōpuhi ana mai no ngā tihi o Tongariro. Kei runga, he mihi ki a koutou katoa. No reira tēnā koutou. These words are born upon the chill winds that blow forth from our sacred mountain, Tongariro. Upon them are acknowledgements to each and every one of you, to the ancestry that sits above you, that connects us as tangata ki te tangata, the global community of all humans. Tongariro te maunga. Po Ngāti Tuwhare Toa, our hapu, our sub-tribe Ngāti Hukairo ki Tongariro, who are the guardians of Tongariro. Tongariro is, the, is inseparable to who and what we are. Tongariro is our creation story. 
Tongariro connects us back to our journey that led us to the Pacific Rim, to various entry points throughout the Pacific, to the islands of the Pacific, and for Māori and for Ngāti ki Tongariro 34 generations ago to be the guardians of Tongariro te mau. Tongariro is our life, it is our soul, it is our spiritual essence. Without Tongariro, we would cease to exist as a people. The connection we have with Tongariro is that that can be compared to the umbilical cord that exists between a baby and its parent and its mother. It is a direct connection to Mother Earth. Within Tongariro are the stories of our people, it is the repository of our knowledge. Upon each breeze, the winds that blow forth from the mountain summits are the breath of our people. We have a saying in Ngāti Hikairu ki Tongariro, Nā te hau mata o ka wiri te kiri, nā te wiri o te kiri, ka piri te tangata, nā te piri o te tangata, ka, ka ora e tātou, which means from the chill winds, it causes our skin to shiver, our bodies to shiver. And from our bodies shivering, we come together as people. And from coming together as people, we find ways to overcome adversity. These words are as relevant today in the uncertainty of COVID and, and warfare as they were 34 generations ago when they were first spoken. Tongariro is the blood of Ngāti Hikairo, the blood that comes forth from the summits, from the slopes, which are the origins of the great rivers of the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Each waterway is life, a life that has been imbued with nurturing, with caring, as it has come from the womb of our mother, Mother Earth, Papatūnuk. We as a people do not exist without that precious gift without Tongariro. Tongariro is a visible sign, a manifestation of who we are as Ngāti Hikairo ki Tongariro. Our aspirations for Tongariro have never changed in 34 generations. We do not deny that entrepreneurial outcomes what we seek are outcomes that are centric to the well-being of what of that in which we hold most precious, which is our mountains. Where people can derive a sustainable living industry in a world where tourism seems to be based on models of extractivism where you take, 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 and humanity seems to be set on soaring off the branch that they sit on. And what we're saying is that there is a model there, driven by the Indigenous people, driven by all Indigenous people, where we can share the values of sustainability with economic outcome, where those very values are the basis for economic outcome where they are, are inclusive, where they embrace all peoples into a way, a model of caring for and nurturing that which we hold most precious. At the moment, we ask people, what is Tongariro to you? And they tell us, Tongariro gives us great pleasure. We ski on the mountain. Tongariro gives us great pleasure, we hike the mountain. Tongariro gives us great pleasure, uh, a recreational satisfaction, uh, tourism satisfaction. And the question we ask is, what do you give back? 
What do you give Tongariro? Because all we hear is what you take. So from Ngāti Kairo ki Tongariro, we ask the world to support us, to support a model that makes Tongariro set the well-being of Tongariro centric to all activities and actions that happen on the mountain. Nō reira ki a koutou. To you all, once again I acknowledge you. I acknowledge you for the work you do. I acknowledge you for the ancestry that sits above each and every one of you. And I acknowledge you for this opportunity to speak. Nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Nō reira. Thank you so much to both Te Ngae, Wanikao and, and, and Connie indeed for this extremely enlightening double presentation, which I feel, Connie, on the one hand, you know, one senses your emphasis on, on co-designing management. On the one hand, clearly we hear from Te Ngae, Wanikao also this emphasis on, on Tungariro-centric approaches. One senses a bit behind also the, uh, the, the um, this issue about taking or giving back. Uh, the whole ethics of, 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 of well-being of the mountains and so on. C could you highlight uh, in, in, in briefly perhaps what you see as sort of two or three good key examples coming out of this sort of uh, indigenous driven approach to, to co-designing management and, and give us perhaps or maybe raise one or two practical examples to share with the group? Yes. Thank you, Connie. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so a good example there is that um, working together to manage um, tracks that are really, really busy, that have a lot of a lot of visitors on them. This was all, of course, pre-COVID um, when the borders shut, but um, one specific track, the Tongariro Opine Crossing, which runs through the middle of, of Tongariro National Park and through a really sacred area, um, had up to 150,000 visitors a year over it um, pre-COVID times. And so um, we sat down with uh, Tanahi's people and worked on what are the, what are the things that we can do uh, to make change here, to make, um, to be able to manage this better so that it doesn't have the impacts, whether they be cultural or or, or impacts on the environment. Um, and so we started working on um, testing at different numbers um, where the impacts might be reduced. So it might show up, a, for example, where um, there's less toileting on the track um, or off the side of the track. And that, that when it gets to that point, you've reached a number that's acceptable or you need to go down a little bit more. Um, so they had sort of initially said to us, let's set a number of somewhere between 800 and 1200 people a day as a maximum, regardless of what the weather does in order for those people to get through. And we'll use some kind of online booking tool um, to set that number. The tricky thing there is that um, the department's policies, uh, the Department of Conservation's policies under the National Parks Act allow for unfettered access for you know, all New Zealanders and for anybody. So to be able to then put limitations in place requires policy change. But what we agreed was in the interim, we would definitely uh, work on some co-management tools and put some of those in place before the start of the next season, which is the 1st of October this year, and see how we go. At least then we've got something to work with um, for potential future policy change if needed. Thank you very much, Connie. And indeed, I think it's very interesting how you highlight both the very practical outcomes of this, but also still that you're struggling with some some policy challenges here, and you're you're not alone in that respect. I I, I feel, uh, I, I uh, and this brings me also to to now uh, bring us all uh, jump in an airplane, even though in these co you know um, carbon reduction times, uh, it's not the right thing to do. But let's all fly now um, towards Africa towards uh, Botswana. Uh, and um, I, I believe that we've had some issues with, okay, Mambo is, is back now. So it's, it's a great pleasure to, well, first of all, thank you for Connie and for the, the New Zealand presentation, big applause from our side. And let's now move to Botswana and uh, 
uh, Okavango Delta, which uh, was inscribed in 2014, uh, an emblematic site, I think it was a uh, the 1,000th site, or uh, there's a, no a specific number in that respect. Uh, I remember that in Doha. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have Susan Katie uh, Metze here and Mambun Tema. Uh, Susan, you are a UNESCO Chair in African Heritage Studies and Sustainable Development. And Mambo, you, you're from the Maun Eastern side of the Delta. Uh, of the indigenous Wayeyi uh, Hoisan, and it, it's it's really great to have you both here and and bring us and bring us some insights from the Okavango Delta. So um, I, I believe that we'll start with you, Susan. The floor is yours. You may need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you yet, so let me just as I don't know if some. Um, let me have a look here. Susan, can anyone help? Um, have okay. Susan speak up. I was trying to get hold of the. There we are, Susan. Fantastic. We see you and we hear you. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Sorry about that. Um, my unmute button was just elusive, but I was saying thank you very much uh, for having us here in this webinar. We are very excited to interact with uh, lots of stakeholders. Uh, and as you already introduced us, we are coming from the University of Botswana Chair, UNESCO Chair. And uh, we hope that uh, at the end of this, we'll be able to share with you the Okavango Delta experiences on the World Heritage 50 years on. We'll, as regards communities, just a little introduction about the Okavango Delta. Of course, as you said, it's the 1000 um, World Heritage Site listed on the UNESCO uh, listing, but uh, it's also a, 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 a World Heritage Site that is uh, very spectacular in that it pours into a desert. It's water in a desert in winter, which in Africa, if you're from the side, you know, the spectacular site of having water in winter it's a dry time of the year and uh, this makes it even more in terms of communal uh, relevance and communal inter interaction as well as maybe decades of interaction with the landscape that people were looking forward to this miraculous happening water coming during the dry season which is supposed to be barren for the most of the country and uh, we also just like to, to emphasize that the ecosystem thrives uh, through an annual flood that comes from the uplands of the uh, Angola. So it's actually a transboundary uh, biophysical uh, phenomena that Botswana is the, actually the, the, the end stream. You have Angola, Namibia, and then Botswana. Botswana, the, the delta, is actually the end stream of the water that is coming from Angola. So it's more a transboundary phenomena for not only the biophysical, but also you have the people that uh, live within the, the, the along the route that this water takes with lots and lots of um, cultural heritage and identities are attached to this landscape. And uh, as uh, Mambo will uh, later on explain on the interaction of the people with the environment, of course, basing on his experience, there are different ethnic groups that live within the Okavango Delta. Uh, most of them uh, indigenous communities that are indigenous to the landscape, but we also have uh, other communities. As we said that the landscape, I mean, the biophysical nature of the ecosystem is such that it traverses through different countries and not only that, but through different ecosystems. So you can imagine the number of people that are both indigenous and non-indigenous that have interacted with the landscape through the years and the, the deposits of communal uh, cultural interaction with the landscape are there. And um, uh, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, sorry, it has cultures, the, 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 the communities that are inhabit the Delta also have interactions with other countries, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Lesotho, South Africa, and we can list a lot. But uh, this is just to show you that in, in, in addition to it just being this majestic 
uh, biophysical environment, it is actually uh, an environment that carries out people's identities. But you will be shocked to hear that it's only listed as a nature site. And these are some of the things as we look into the 50 years of the World Heritage Convention that we have to be reflecting on, that uh, we have landscapes that um, of course, majestic in their biophysical features, but uh, they actually also carry other identities that when we go into international policy implementation, like listing of sites, we, we, we tend to focus on only one aspect of them. And this is the, an, an ongoing debate. Not that um, people are not acknowledged within the World Heritage Convention listing of the site as a nature site, but you would have thought that a site like this that, that traverses countries of people would have been a mixed site rather than maybe just solely a nature site. So I'm going to give over to Mambo to give the experiences of people with the Kavango Delta. Mambo, over to you. Thank you, Susan. Okay. I think he might have fallen out again. He has unstable okay. internet. Oh, uh, because he, he's having, we are in two different parts of the country. The Okavango Delta is up north and I'm down south. It's a thousand kilometers between us. So he is having uh, problems with internet connections where he is. But I'll just uh, talk about the people of the Okavango Delta that uh, it, it- Or maybe I can ask you a question, Susan, uh, okay. in the meantime, uh, uh, because it's been such an interesting and important case to follow. And I always remember the first conversations with Hoi San as well about worried about issues of eviction and and so on but at the same time you know that that moment when when uh representatives uh like mr satow uh stood up with the but uh, the delegation to celebrate the inscription uh, and it would be interesting to hear from you sort of what are some of the con 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 current issues that indigenous peoples i mean and uh and local communities are are facing right now, um, maybe, and then maybe Mambo can elaborate a bit on some of these issues afterwards and what you see as some of the opportunities for, for ways forward from your perspective. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Yes, indeed, the listing of the site brings opportunities in that, uh, especially for African, let me say from my research, I see that listing of sites in the World Heritage Convention actually brings uh, opportunity of heavy national governments focus on, or on the sites more than they were doing, but also it also bring another aspect of people around there now getting a ton of um, visitors that may be local as well as international. So yes, it is a celebration for countries like Botswana because it also it is second world heritage site. So you can imagine we have been running on one and you have countries that have lots and lots of uh, world heritage sites. It was actually for even for Botswana government and an achievement. But of course, there are challenges. And uh, when you, you mentioned eviction, I wouldn't say there are evictions that came with the listing. The, the, the listing actually found the site already as a Ramza site. The Ramza site found the site already as a protected area. And these are some of the uh, observations that I make in my work that protected area model for Africa has actually the one that affected the evictions. So. It, there are more likely to be issues that are now carried over to the World Heritage listing and because the Ramsar listing didn't deal much with them. But uh, during the listing, there wasn't really any eviction that took place. It, the protected era model had already made that possible. But uh, people may not necessarily be worried about being evicted because it's a policy here in Botswana, not only in the Okavango Delta, but it's carried out in other parts of the country. What is actually are important in terms of what I observed through my research is how are we making it possible for the people who made way for these protected areas to have their identities overlaid and acknowledged and expressed, especially when you get to the Kobango Delta, where tourism is very, very much lucrative. But are we seeing the, the, the local communities, the indigenous communities becoming significant parts of this tourism? through various models and how can we develop models that make sure that they are actually significantly acknowledged and allowed to express themselves through tourism in the landscape that they have now 
giving way to government development. I hope that answers your question. It does, and it shows indeed the deep challenges that we also see in the conversations going on from, from Tongariro and so on, that, that the, this is basically continuous work and uh, that to, to maintain these strong ideas of care and identity and practices in the face of other development initiatives and so on. I think that's a very important lesson to, to keep with us. Thank you so much. What I suggest we do is that we keep a space at the end of this conversation for Mambo to join in when he can come in later. Uh, and in the meantime, we move ahead in, in okay. order to yes, res respect the timing situation. Is that acceptable, Susan? Oh, that's okay. We've, we've been talking on, on WhatsApp. Yes, so I just wanted to highlight this for, for the, especially for the um, International Policy World Heritage Convention because it's work that I do. I'm very much uh, uh, passionate about cultural heritage overlay into what we call nature spaces. I've been dealing with this since 2005, since my PhD, I've worked on sustainable development and cultural heritage as an enabler of sustainable development. And I see that through the Okavango Delta in particular, that one way through which we can bring back communities is to look at uh, actively overlaying the 203 ICH convention, because while the 1972, of course, has a, as uh, the initial speaker spoke about 15 years ago when it adopted community-based approach. But we, we have to say that the, 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 the operations on the ground are still the, the, the core model, I mean, the core zone model. Of course, in Todilo, it led to evictions. Todilo is our first world heritage site, but we can actively as international policy uh, uh, implementers look at ways like overlaying uh, actively overlaying the 203 ICH convention on sites that have been listed as World Heritage Sites, because the ICH convention for Africa in particular already brings that people aspects to the site, whether they were overlooked by the 72 convention or not. So it's automatically, where are the folklores, where are the, mm. the people identities? And by so doing, it enhances the people expression of sites that may have been looked at mainly from the biophysical, uh, majestic biophysical characters like the Okavango Delta, you cannot ignore, you know, the, the flood piles uh, characteristics that come with it and you can be swamped by them and forget about the people, which I think okay. happened. I, I, I hear in this chat now, thanks a lot, Susan. I hear that, that Mambo has come on board. Oh, Mambo, okay. can I quickly give, give you the floor while you're still in? You, you, you're welcome to concentrate your comments in a, in a couple of minutes, just to make sure that we don't lose you and, and that we, 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 you know, we, we get a strong perspective from you. Welcome, Mambo. And thank you, Susan, for those important comments on integrating different value sets. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, yes. Thank you, Dr. Kitumezi, for your submissions. And uh, of course, of course, perhaps I'm a bit late, I've been struggling with the connection, but I think like what uh, the doctor was saying, uh, you know, in terms of the voice of the communities in the Okavango Delta and the uh, other wetlands areas, you find that, you know, the most intriguing aspect of it is about, uh, you know, who are the managers and who are the controllers, who has got access, who uses what, and the legalities that come with it regarding the Okavango Delta as a World Heritage Site is such that, you know, the, the, the most important aspect of it is that the government has, has established community-based natural resource management program and the policy through which the community trusts around the Okavango Delta and those communities as well that are just villages are living adjacent to the Okavango Delta are co-managers or co-players in the management and the conservation of the Okavango Delta as a World Heritage Site. So the government and the people work together in a more participatory manner, but the, the honors of it is that the implementer is the government, whereas the communities are most likely the beneficiaries. So in terms of bringing together the two aspects of it in terms of planning and implementation, I strongly believe that the voice of communities needs to be taken, 
you know, with that utmost importance that it deserves, such that at the end of the day, we have got an infusion of indigenous knowledge systems, as well as the scientific knowledge or the practitioners and the, 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 the researchers on the side. So I strongly believe that in terms of what uh, the Okavango Delta represents and what it stands for is that it has influenced people, it has determined the lives of the people living within and around it, and they have also come up with taboos and totems and other conservation models that would then, when infused into the modern knowledge system, I strongly believe it will definitely lead to the perfect conservation of the Okavango Delta. So I, I'm a bit lost regarding what was discussed, but I think you know, I've tried to at least give you an insight of what I believe is, uh, you know, taking on board uh, regarding the World Heritage Site that the Okavango Delta is. Thank you so much, Mambo, and indeed uh, extremely pertinent and to the point. And, and this shift you're calling for mm -hmm. also from ideas of communities as beneficiaries to co-managers, the fusion of science and traditional knowledge the practice of working out this co-management, which is really seems to be a red thread going through yeah. our, our talk today. And, and I, I'll quickly now, thank you both of you for bringing that perspective from the Delta. We're now gonna fly back again to, to Australia to continue. We're a bit behind schedule. Apologies for rushing you all through. It's a very big pleasure now to, to actually move to the Central Victorian Goldfields, which is a World Heritage bid. And we've got the coordinator here, Susan Fayad. Welcome, Susan. And also uh, Chris Meadows-Taylor, uh, the mayor of the Central Goldfield Shire Council. So um, thanks again to Susan and Mambo. Uh, hopefully there'll be space at the end of the discussion to go back to you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, due to time constraints, apologies, we move uh, back to Australia. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Peter. They've been fantastic presentations so far. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting Mayor, Councillor Chris Meadows, Taylor, and myself to present the journey that 13 local governments are going on to inscribe the Central Victorian Goldfields on the World Heritage List. We'd first like to acknowledge the many traditional owners of country, which includes the region we'll talk about today. These are the Berenji Gadjan, Jajawarung, Eastern Ma, Tungarung. Wadarung, Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Yorta Yorta peoples. In all areas of the world, the global gold rushes happened on traditional country and First Nations people are leading their story that is told and the benefits that they gain through the Goldfields World Heritage Bid. The Central Victorian Goldfields is in the state of Victoria in southeastern Australia. The region includes 13 different local governments, including two cities, it covers an area of around 40,000 square kilometres and has a population of over half a million people. The depth and breadth of the region's mid-century gold rush history and ancient and living Aboriginal cultural heritage is evidenced throughout. While we know that the goldfields itself is significant, the full potential of the region is relatively untapped and communities in the region face many challenges to their quality of life and sustainability. And for example, we know that many parts are amongst the most socioeconomic disadvantaged areas in Australia, which is shown here in red. I'll now hand over to Mayor Councillor Meadows-Taylor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sue, and thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. We'll go fairly quickly because we're running behind time. Local government, of course, varies hugely around our countries. Um, for those of you less familiar with Australia, basically the system that we've inherited here is the one from Britain. We have elected councils of councillors in the state of Victoria, uh, where we're based, as Susan, Susan showed you before, we have 79 councils. In the area that we're talking about, those councils in, uh, vary between five and nine councillors. Uh, the average being seven. They're all elected mainly on a district basis uh, in each, each uh, council area, some for the whole council area. 
Um, before 1995, and that will be important for what I'll say in a moment, there were over 300 before there was an amalgamation, just really too many of very, very small councils, particularly in the rural areas. When World Heritage listing for the Central Victorian Goldfields was first proposed in the light, late 1980s, it, was, uh, it, it faced real trouble with so many small councils. There was a real fear that town planning considerations would all be overtaken. These very small councils felt dominated by the fear of UNESCO, by the fear of this concept of World Heritage Listing. And in the end, for a range of reasons, but based around that, uh, the bid or the, the attempt of a bid collapsed at that time because it was looking at a whole geographic area, unlike the serial listing that we later adopted. In 2007, 2008, the global financial crisis led a number of us to work together to look at uh, the future and, and, and future prosperity and opportunity. Also to recognize that a lot of our rich built heritage from that process and that era of the, of the mid-Victorian gold crash in, in uh, the 19th century was crumbling. And uh, as Susan said, a lot of uh, disadvantage. So small, smaller, poorer councils had difficulty maintaining it. That led us to a revised new bid, which started back, back then to actually say, let's recreate the opportunities and the wealth in the 19th century for the 21st century and beyond and conserve our, our heritage. We took the learnings from, the, from that previous period and we said, look, not only will we engage with local government, we will have local government in the driving seat. And so that bid of 13 local government councils actually uh, started then, we put that, assembled that, and it is still driving the, the process. Certainly other agencies are key. Obviously, heritage is absolutely fundamental because it needs to, in the end, uh, to own this. Uh, tourism is imp has important considerations, but the local councils actually drive it. And then sort of fi finally then for three key benefits of that. First of all, ownership. They own the process. So unlike the fear of the unknown, they own, they control. Very, very important. Secondly, the councils and the, count, the elected councillors have a direct input to their communities that elected them. So they're able to talk through the communities, both the opportunities that World Heritage Listing provides, the reasons for it, but also any concerns or, or fears and work through that. So that link with the communities. But thirdly and finally, given the, the flavor of this, uh, this, uh, this presentation and this, this uh, session, this workshop, is that everything that local councils do the uh, in, in uh, uh, certainly at this time is about and land use all involves consultation engagement and full input from indigenous and traditional owners we don't do anything without that input and so councils are incredibly well placed to work through with our partners, the traditional owners that Susan mentioned before, to, to work through through that process. So what I would leave that the message with you is simply it actually works to have local government, however it's constructed around, around the world, have them very much front and foremost of driving and owning bids for World Heritage Listing and the engagement they can provide. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I'll just move to the next slide. So our model for the bid, um, as the Mayor mentioned, prioritises socio-economic outcomes for local communities. And there are many examples around the world that highlight that when world heritage is pursued as a catalyst for socio and economic transformation from the outset, it's most likely to achieve this objective. And to achieve our vision for the region, we are applying a sustainable tourism framework and investment priorities. We're using the happiness index with local communities. And this is an OECD recognized tool that ensures local citizens shape the sustainable tourism priorities to best benefit them and their local areas. We're applying the UN sustainable development goals and UNESCO's HAL approach. 
And all of this is supported by the region-wide cultural landscape serial listing, which makes it possible to tell the full story of the mid 19th century gold rushes, as well as the Aboriginal cultural heritage narratives. Whilst at the same time, it provides an opportunity to spread the benefits of World Heritage Listing across the entire region. So we're repositioning the region as a World Heritage region, not just the selected sites. And to conclude, just some reflections. The journey towards World Heritage Listing fast tracks, the high level and local commitment that our Mayor just spoke about, the support, community pride, resilience and investment needed. That building socioeconomic outcomes and gains into the bid makes it real, relevant and an opportunity for everyone. Achieving the sustainable development goals is the long journey and it must be prioritised from the outset. And as much effort must be put into achieving these broader and deeper benefits as is put into achieving World Heritage Listing itself. And facilitating grassroots partnerships needs to be implemented early. And we're looking at that, our, our grassroots partnership to lead to a sustainable and locally led governance model after inscription. And participatory and community stakeholder involvement in heritage and management practice on the ground is currently lagging here, but there's a real opportunity to get change at all levels of government during the bids development. So thank you again for the opportunity to share our experiences with you today. Thank you so much both for, for an inspiring conversation. Indeed, you're insisting upon, on the one hand, that um, we have this, uh, sorry, I need to just turn, someone's insisting on calling me here and I'll try to get, get, get out of that immediately. Here we go. Um, of the effectiveness of these, um, these grassroots initiatives and, uh, oh God, just a second. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, and the grassroots initiatives and actually how, how we can move towards having having a concrete impact uh, in terms of the bid that you're making. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could sort of highlight one example, a very concrete way of, of how this grassroots initiative uh, led, led to a transformation in, in the way you did the bid. Uh, uh, that would be very appreciated. Thank you. Did you want me to do that or would you like to do that, Chris? Oh, look, I can have, have a first go about it. Um, I, I think, again, it was the issue of um, the opportunity of local governments to come together and to talk about, at the time it was a global financial crisis, so we, we, we wanted to see how we could, how what the future looked like about prosperity, how we could conserve our rich conservation. So it was driven by need but we had a range of councils and a range of elected councils coming together, working together on that. And so each of those councils then went back in their own council planning, own their own engagement with their communities, in their engagement with the traditional owners, were able to get that grassroots engagement. So driven by both need, driven by opportunity, driven by a vision for the future, but, but the opportunity at all stages through this constantly to get that grassroots engagements working through elected councils, as well as other, a range of other stakeholders, obviously. But I think that that's probably the key bits, uh, Susan. Excellent. That, that I think well, I'll, I'll uh, thank you. And, and we need those success stories and in, in coming together, especially faced with also the number of places where there's so much distrust even uh, among uh, grassroots initiatives and, and central authorities and so on. So thank you so much, both of you, for coming here and sharing that. We're a little bit behind schedule. I must say that um, we, we, we will extend the session till two o'clock to re, 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 leave room for, for discussion. I think we had an extremely productive set of inputs here um, and uh, uh, sharing lessons that show that all the things that are happening on the ground. Indeed, I, many times I always say, it's not the World Heritage Convention in Paris that's innovating, it's people on the ground that are doing the hard work. And we need to learn much more from what's happening there. Uh, I think that's very clear. Um, and your, 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 all your examples show that. Let me now turn to the next segment of our event. And this is basically uh, going back to the advisory bodies who, who actually have, a, have placed a very key role 
in also nurturing and, and creating a space for a conversation on community and rights issues throughout the last decade uh, or so. Uh, of course, even longer, but I mean, I would certainly say that it has been intensifying over the last 10 years. And this is a moment for us to maybe get some insights from, from you all three. We've got Gwenel Bourdin, who was director of the World Heritage Evaluation Unit at ECOMAS. We have Clemens Cooper, who's the Evaluations and Operations Officer in the World Heritage Program. And we've got Rohit Yasu, who's project manager in ECROM in Rome, uh, uh, dealing with uh, urban heritage, climate change, disaster risk management, among other things. So welcome all the three of you. Can I start with um, giving the word to you, Gwenel? Uh, sort of from an ECOMOS perspective, you, I know you sit, work a lot on evaluations, among other things. Can you tell us a bit about what you see some of the current issues are and future challenges and opportunities in, in strengthening community and rights work from your perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you. It was very interesting uh, presentations we, we, we heard. So, um, uh, Peter, you, you started with the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, World Heritage Convention. So, <laughs> in relation to this, maybe if I may, uh, I, I thought that it was useful to, to, to go back to history and to see where we come from, in a way. Uh, because this is the 50th anniversary of the convention, but you might be aware that uh, uh, four uh, strategic objectives were adopted for the implementation of the convention in 2002. And the four C's, as we call this, were credibility, conservation, capacity building, communication. The fifth C, communities, uh, was added in 2007 thanks to a proposal by, by uh, New Zealand and to enhance the role of communities in implementation of the convention. So you see it was only in 2007, if I may say, <laughs> that communities were, were introduced in the, in the system. Thin, since then, uh, changes were made, of course, to the operational guidelines. And this was raised by Chrissy in her presentation, the important that it is that such a tool uh, at the international level uh, uh, might reflect the, the ongoing thinking practices, but uh, should be understood as well as, as a tool where uh, uh, there, there is a need of consensus of states parties around this tool. So it uh, could be difficult as well to introduce changes to this tool. Um, and in relation to this, uh, even though so changes were made to the operational guidelines, as regards involvement of local communities, only in 2015, uh, free prior informed consent of indigenous people were introduced in the, in the operational guidelines. So this is just a brief, uh, let's say, historical uh, overview as regards changes made in the operational guidelines, but it's important to remind where we come from. And in fact, this is to come to my point that big changes were made in 2021 in the operational guidelines. I, I don't know if, if you are all aware of these changes, but from my point of view, even though it could be seen as some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, administrative uh, changes, it's not administrative changes, and, and I will explain uh, uh, why. So changes adopted uh, last year, uh, uh, changes to the operational guidelines, were, were adopted to, to introduce what we call a, a, a two, two evaluation phases. So there is a preliminary evaluation phase and the evaluation phase. And uh, through this introduction of a new mechanism in terms of evaluation of nomination dossiers, specific attention was uh, given to uh, 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 local communities and indigenous people. So uh, uh, through changes we, uh, the committee adopted in Annex 3, that is now the preliminary assessment request form, and Annex 5, that is the nomination dossier format, specific sections as regards uh, participation of uh, uh, local communities and indigenous people 
has been introduced in, in the format for this request. So if, if I may go uh, through this uh, uh, quickly, uh, so this is related to engagement of local communities, whether or not free prior informed consent was op obtained and how, and uh, how uh, uh, the identification of stakeholders, uh, how they are uh, um, included into the management of the property. So it means that if now the state party is going to submit a nomination dossier, he will have to submit information in relation to these issues. And if this information is not in a nomination dossier, the nomination dossier won't be considered complete. So it could be seen as a tiny administrative change, but from my point of view, um, it's a way to ask in a formal way states party to submit this information. So to ensure that this uh, 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 processes have been made at the tentative list stage, and it's a way for the advisory body to get this information and to assess this information in a formal way. So I think it's it's a big uh, uh, change, if I may say. Thank you. Thank you, Gwenel. I think it's important to have a substantive <laughs> note like that, no, and insist upon it, because very often these these changes take place, and from a grassroots perspective, they may not necessarily be seen or, or understood to in, in their full potential. So that's very much appreciated. Yeah. If I now shift to, to you, Clemens, and say, okay, well, one thing is we're gonna move forward, better nominations, hopefully a new generation of nominations that are socially responsible, that that uh, that take up what Chrissy called the duty to care, et cetera, et cetera. But what about all the existing sites? No, we've seen the, these, these tough cases now with evictions and or planned evictions, at least in in, in existing sites like Murungoro and so on, uh, and and so there's how how do you see what do you see from an IUCN perspective um, as as some of the key issues, challenges, and opportunities in in relation to to this whole World Heritage field? Thank you, Clement. Yes, thanks a lot, Peter. And and firstly, also uh, greetings from Switzerland. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for these very thought provoking and interesting uh, presentations and good to see many familiar faces again after a long time. Um, so to, to respond to your question, Peter, I think firstly, I'd like to connect to back to what, what Grinnell has said and, and connect back to the title. Um, of today's session, which is becoming World Heritage 50 years on uh, the role of rights and communities. If, if we put it into a nutshell, what Grenell has just described about the recent changes to the convention, I think we can say becoming World Heritage 50 years on is impossible without considering rights and communities. Um, or at least this is what the standards, what the rule book of the convention, uh, the operational guidelines of the convention um, are providing for. And I think it's important to know that these relatively recent changes to the operational guidelines do not only uh, concern uh, the, the stages before inscription of a World Heritage Site, so it does not only concern uh, tentative lists, uh, nominations, the evaluations of the sites and the inscription of the site, but also what comes after uh, the inscription of a World Heritage Site um, in order to ensure that the outstanding universal value is maintained and to ensure that human rights, the rights of uh, indigenous peoples and local communities uh, are respected and that uh, local communities and indigenous peoples are uh, involved in line with FPIC. Um, so uh, it's nowadays the operational guidelines recognize indigenous peoples as stakeholders and rights holders. Uh, they call for the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples. Um, they consider the interlinkage between bio biological diversity and cultural diversity and a thorough shared understanding um, of the respective World Heritage property. And it's um, universal, the, the, at the global level, the outstanding universal value, but also uh, the value at national and local level. Um, 
so I could go on there, but this this would take perhaps a, a bit too much of the time. Uh, nevertheless, perhaps uh, um, I'd like to raise three points and waste them uh, and think them through these three key themes you've outlined, outlined Peter. So current issues, future issues, and opportunities. And I think the first one in terms of current issue that, that relates back to, to your question, um, we the, the convention has evolved over the past 50 years to increasingly um, to take a look, uh, have a lens for human rights issues, uh, ha look at uh, communities, uh, at indigenous peoples. And as the, the attention is drawn to that, there are more and more issues that come to the fore that have perhaps not come to the fore in the past. That, that was also the case in the past, but because that is now becoming more and more a requirement and a common practice to look at these issues, there are also more issues in this respect that are, uh, that are detected. And um, how, how these issues are addressed are very challenging um, for, for all involved. And, and of course, we, we've seen uh, uh, many cases across the world in all parts of the world where um, there have been or there st still are uh, conflict situations that, that call for a resolution for dialogue for uh, the full involvement of the concerned communities in line with FPIC. Um, so in, in, in a way one, one could perhaps argue that because of these uh, requirements there's a widening gap between implementation and the requirements. So I think uh, the, the, we definitely need to catch up with the implementation of the requirements in the convention more generally. And um, the convention is also on the course of yeah, yeah, further increasing the number of sites inscribed on the list, further expanding the area. So the area subject to World Heritage uh, are set to grow uh, further, which also means that this, these standards and uh, the current governance system of World Heritage will in future apply to more areas and uh, potentially also to areas where without the World Heritage Convention, it would not be possible to raise uh, certain issues. So that in that respect, I think it's a, it's a major opportunity. Uh, there are two other points, if, if you allow me, Peter, yeah. uh, I try to be very brief. Um, I, I think uh, th that goes back to one point Chrissy has raised uh, about resources. Um, I, I would fully agree with that and, and generally just stress that um, the World Heritage System is already overloaded and that, that will remain an issue in, in future. It's uh, financially overstretched. If we look at, at some well-known statistics about the convention, uh, we had uh, $6,900 per site uh, in the mid 90s. Today we have $2,600 per site and I'm not even sure if inflation is counted in in these figures. Um, and if, if I just narrow that down to um, our field of work at IUCN for natural world heritage sites, that means that we have 0.002 US dollars per hectare. And uh, if we look at other uh, activities for large scale landscapes, uh, including conservation activities, uh, the, the more usual figure would be $10 per hectare. So we have a shortfall of $9.998 per hectare uh, in the World Heritage Convention, I would argue. And uh, we, we will need these $9.9 to uh, yeah, yes, to, to implement these requirements as well and to, to do what, what Chris has suggested, to have a sustainable and long-term funding, for instance, for the International Indigenous Peoples Forum and uh, many other activities that are needed for an inclusive long-term conservation of uh, World Heritage sites. And the Thank third, you. yeah, okay. I think no, I skipped please. the third point, um, no, please, yes. which is just uh, something that is also coming to the fore in many um, uh, similar events like the one today, that, that's really the point on language and indigenous languages in particular. Uh, we see a co occurrence of the disappearance of biodiversity and of languages. Um, and uh, with the languages, we are also losing very important knowledge, for instance, to conserve uh, the sites. Then the opportunity on that um, 
we have the UNESCO decades on for, for indigenous people's languages, uh, which is something I think we should, um, an effort we should uh, join in, uh, in future. Thanks. Thank you, Clemens. And uh, you cover a wide territory there. I, I note your point also about actually the widening gap, uh, and, and which is both, both a gap of finance, but also a resource of, of capacity, but also willingness to address calling a spade a spade, as uh, um, Chrissy said. So this widening gap, Rohit, I mean, Ikram plays such a key role in terms of capacity building in the World Heritage Convention. Um, what, what do you see as some of the, the sort of issues and challenges and opportunities to sort of, you know, respond to this widening gap? Are, 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 we, are, we, are we delivering here or what, 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 what do you see? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to mention uh, that yes, of course, uh, for Ikram, uh, people-centered approach is definitely one of the key uh, areas of uh, engagement for many, many years. And uh, very recently, it has actually turned into people, nature and culture. So basically, all three elements have to be seen together and not separated. So I think from that perspective, it plays a very important role in our capacity building activities. Um, especially for the World Heritage, uh, you know, uh, properties under the leadership program, which is a joint undertaking between ECROM and IUCN. Uh, now, regarding your question, whether we are delivering, I think uh, we are delivering from the point of view of raising awareness, maybe among the site managers, uh, because uh, just like talking about uh, stakeholders, we have expanded the definition to really bring in the, that rights holders are not uh, stakeholders and we have to give them a specific recognition is I think an important thing to be recognized by those who are at decision making or the site management level because often they just club them all together. The other point which is quite critical is that outstanding universal value is definitely a requirement but it is not something which can be seen uh, disconnected from the larger sets of values to which the communities hold on. So again, expanding the whole uh, notion of values uh, is an important step so that site managers and those who are taking decisions just don't restrict themselves to something called OUV without understanding that those OUVs also hold on to these other, if, if those larger sets of values are gone, then OUV is not going to survive. So I think that's the other important um, aspect that we are trying to bring in in all our capacity building initiatives to raise that kind of awareness. The third important point, which we are also trying to really uh, put emphasis on, is uh, the aspect of governance. Because for long, we haven't seen governance as a larger uh, kind of a context within which management happens. So site management was a seen as an activity in itself. But without having a governance system that recognizes uh, all these dimensions of transparency, equity, and you know uh, where the, all these indigenous communities and their rights are kind of considered, I think it will not make sense to think about site management in itself. So I think the third important dimension is uh, the expanding the or emphasizing the uh, the aspect of uh, governance. And the last important point, which is uh, I think uh, really really critical, is. Uh, what is a community? And we are now more and more emphasizing that community is not a monolithic one whole. In fact, the important thing for us is to recognize that communities are much diverse, have many, many different layers. And, you know, indigenous cannot be clubbed together with, sometimes this is another problem because when you call local communities, you kind of automatically assume that indigenous communities are kind of, you are, you are kind of getting, giving them their due. But in that process, we are actually, uh, they disappear. Uh, you know, in the name of local community. So, giving recognition to all uh, all kinds of communities and all layers of communities is really important. And I will end by saying that what we are now also trying to put a lot of emphasis in our capacity building programs is the dimension of traditional knowledge. And traditional knowledge, not from the point of view of just learning what is traditional knowledge, but how do you apply traditional knowledge in practice? It means that you can't just look at them as something coming from the past which is romanticized, but you have to see how that knowledge which has been accumulated over generations by these communities can be made relevant in today's context. So there's a lot of innovation needed to make it you know, useful and relevant. And that's something we are also putting a lot of emphasis in our capacity building activities. But to just conclude, I think 
from the point of view of raising the awareness, making them um, sensitive towards these issues, uh, giving them all this vocabulary or, or the methodologies and tools, there needs to be one step uh, next to make this really, uh, you know, uh, happening on the ground, let's have to say. Like having seen implementation means that we have to strengthen our monitoring mechanisms. If we don't measure whether we are delivering or not delivering, all these will be very nice concepts, very nice thinking, but it is not going to make change on the ground. So I think that's the next, I would say the last mile that we have to cross is putting in place those monitoring measures to really evaluate how much are we really making change on the ground. Thank you so much, Rohit. And indeed, I think drawing attention to the intersections between complexity in terms of values, governance systems, knowledge systems, and so on, and saying this is a practical issue, it's not just a talk shop around interesting concepts, I think is extremely valuable. And it shows, again, the value that I think the advisory bodies bring to this and also perhaps changing how, how conflicts are dealt with. I would now like to suggest that uh, we open the floor to, to, to questions from uh, participants. Uh, there, are, there are a number that have said they potentially would come with a question or two to, and please, your, your questions can be directed to uh, either the advisory bodies or to the excellent presentations, the keynote uh, and the panelists we had before about practical experiences. Um, so let me open the floor and, and please either indicate in the chat or by raising your hand that you would like to add a question. I, I, I would like to again apologize for, for participants, panelists and so on. Please hang in there another 15 minutes. We, we, this, is, this is not what you were scheduled to do, but I, I sense the commitment with all of you that I'm sure that you, you manage to fit it in, hopefully. Thank you. I see, um, I see there are some, some questions. There was a question, I believe, at some point to Sue uh, and, and to Mambo about uh, the situation in the Delta. Uh, would the person like to step forward with that question? We had a question from Nima Katasha. Is Nima still with us? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Excellent. Nima, please go ahead. Well, um, do I need to put a camera on? No. Okay. Wait. Okay. My question. The question was just, uh, I think it was already answered by, because I, I asked before, before Mambo um, shared his, um, his, uh, his, I don't know, his comments also. And my interest was just knowing how do the community and government um, uh, work together and, and uh, not to put interest only of uh, tourism um forward for for the for the for the sites or for the national parks because uh it's easy to for the government to say okay well we uh, because we have interest from the touristic side or so and it's actually maybe bringing a lot of uh, money or income in probably we now push uh, aside the interest of the community so that was only my concern and perhaps I, I, should I take this opportunity again to, to ask one more question? Please. And this could be directed to IUCN, uh, Clemens, and maybe any any of the uh, of the panelists. Um, I come from Tanzania, so uh, it's obvious that my, my my concern would really direct the the issue that is going on in there now of the of the conflicts uh, between the government and community uh, regarding the uh, stay or the, uh, the, uh, the land. Some people have been evicted or displaced. So what is your voice? What do you say about this? And where, where do you act? When do you act when such kind of uh, stuff happens? And uh, are, you, are you into into this with the government or, or what is your role there? Do you get there and say, and maybe speak to the government or maybe try to, to, to intervene the situation? Thank you. Thank you. So let's take them one by one. Uh, thank you for that question, Nima. So first question goes to our, our panelists from Botswana. Uh, Sue and Mambo, are you still there? Susan, I see you're there. You need to yeah. unmute yourself. I don't know if Mambo is around, but I okay. think 
Nima was uh, said Mambo asked answered in a way that the government has the CBNRM program, Community Based Natural Resource Management, even though it's still based on tourism. But there are other licenses for subsistence farming. I mean, sort of subsistent fishing and uh, that, but the access, I think for Okavango Delta really for communities, the access is that uh, because communities don't have the capital to invest in, in the biophysical environment as it is, they're most of the time relegated to menial jobs. And the government now has uh, tried to have a, a land allocation system recently actually there have been calls for to operators that are only citizens to try and up access to tourism because it's the lucrative thing it's the lucrative activity going on so you can't tell people that oh there's a lucrative activity going on but you are only going to do the little stuff so that's the contention actually that local communities are saying we want to be part of the bigger economic activity which is tourism I don't know if Mambo has any comment on that. Thank you, Susan. Emma, um, thank you again, Dr. Kitumeti. I think the 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 other thing will then also be regarding like you are talking about subsistence fishing, uh, you know, even sometimes Mokoro excursions, like uh, there are those other alternative tourism activities that communities have actually come up with with regards to at least getting or deriving certain benefits from the tourism industry, including cultural or heritage tourism as supplementary activities to the main uh, nature-based tourism. So communities are doing uh, Mukoro excursion, which is Mukoro is a traditional boat that uh, you know they used to transport themselves and their goods across the big rivers of the Okavango. And they also do the traditional fishing and the other, you know, activities that would at least, if not benefiting directly from the Okavango Delta in terms of tourism, they are at least benefiting indirectly as role players in the tourism industry surrounding the Okavango Delta. Thank you, Mambo, and thank you, Susan. And I'd, I'd like, like, like now to pass the word on to you, Clemens, uh, to, to respond to Nima's question. And then uh, a, a last comment from you, Chrissy, before turning over the word to, to Bender to, to, to close the session. Clemens, please. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Nima, for the question. Um, so, so essentially two questions. What, what's IUCN's voice and uh, what is our role? I, I think, firstly, um, what is our voice? If, if you're referring to Lol Yondo, uh, IUCN has uh, issued a statement uh, very recently where IUCN considers that any uh, violence against uh, or forced evictions of uh, uh, indigenous peoples and locally com local communities are entirely um, unacceptable. Um, in, in terms of world heritage and our role there, uh, so Loliondo is uh, outside uh, the respective world heritage property, but our role in the uh, convention is, uh, first of all, to be the advisory body for natural uh, world heritage sites, and in this instance, uh, mixed sites um, as well, jointly uh, with uh, ICOMOS. And, um, on uh, uh, the the case you're referring to, um, it, it just um, firstly be, before going into that, perhaps important to uh, just reiterate that uh, IUCN considers that any forced evictions of indigenous peoples and local communities um, are entirely unacceptable. And uh, in this instance, we have not been in a position yet to verify the situation in uh, relation uh, to more recent allegations. Um, and uh, there is a recommendation by the World Heritage Committee to dispatch an advisory mission uh, jointly with the other advisory bodies um, to uh, uh, the ongoing uh, World Heritage site, um, which would be an opportunity for IUCN's role to weigh in and an opportunity uh, for IUCN's voice as well. Um, then uh, uh, on that point, um, 
we could also uh, go back to a previous uh, UNESCO ICOMOS IUCN mission from uh, 2019. Uh, one of the recommendations was that um, local communities and other stakeholders uh, should be engaged, that this engagement should continue in exploring um, alternative uh, solutions uh, to the current voluntary resettlement schemes and uh, that ought to be consistent with the policies of the World Heritage Convention and uh, relevant international norms. Um, so I, I don't know if that responds to your question, but uh, that's uh, an attempt to give a very brief answer to, I think, a very complex um, point. Thanks. Thank you very much, Clemens. Chrissy, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Peter. I just wanted to come in on the tourism. Um, and that's a, a little bit, uh, expanding a little bit on what I said about Indigenous peoples being engaged and involved in you know anything that needs to be developed and and impacts on their lives so the wet tropics uh, world heritage area in australia has um, had indigenous people's input in the design the development the promotion and the delivery of a wet tropics sustainable tourism plan and that plan outlines and gives roadmap for ways that um, indigenous peoples in, within the rainforest can develop their own tourism activities um, and looking at the benefits and equity across the board. Um, and they're also developing a landscape hub whereby you could get educated on, on, the, on the net uh, that draws on a lot of information. Um, and the whole while uh, the tourism industry itself has been engaged in the development of this and they've taken it on board and, and embraced it so because it then fits into their agenda. So you've got to look at all the parties across the communities, across the industry, and make sure everybody's engaged and involved in it. And, you know, sort of you have a much better outcome. Thank you, Chrissy. And again, for really pulling us where, to, where we need to be in, in practical terms about get, getting this to work. Uh, and how how to go about that. I really appreciate that. And it's it's nice to sort of end there as well. And I think it's been a beauty of, of this session that, that really on the one hand, we haven't shied away from talking about the serious issues and gaps we have, but at the same time showing that there are ways forward that can be mutually beneficial for everyone involved in, in a spirit of, of care and a duty of care and so on. So thank you for that, Chrissy. And, uh, okay. and I'd like now to hand the word over to the former president of the R Common Dignity, uh, group, Bente Matisan, to, to, to say, come with a, a few closing remarks. Bente, the word, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, it's been a pleasure to follow the workshop, and many thanks to Peter, who has uh, challenged us in looking for the way forward based on uh, your experience with the uh, right issues for decades and a lot of publication and field work is um, the basis of your um, way of challenging us uh, today. And thank you very much to the organizers of this workshop, the communication um, uh, task team of the Overcoming Dignity Right Based Approaches Working Group. Uh, special thanks to Paulette Wallace for uh, um, being responsible for putting uh, up this program together with Peter. And not to mention Lara Malou, Flor Marik, Angela Kurmi, Rinala Lato, Deder McDermott, and Rosella Mata, who translates it to Spanish. And from the ECOMA Secretariat, in turn, Vera Giannini, and some support in advance from Crystal Buckley and Nicole Frances Fini. And I would, Peter, you have duly uh, thanked the, the Presenters of the brilliant uh, case studies that challenge us with um, from from uh, New Zealand, Botswana, and Australia. And a special thank to to um, to our keynote speaker um, who uh, uh, challenged us with uh, uh, looking at um, this this the design, development, and delivery of. Um, of uh, uh, management in the site and to 
to stress that we need to involve um, uh, indigenous people in any activity which involve their lives in design, develop and delivery. And also to, to Gwenelle and the three IBs um, who, who um, challenged us and updated us on the importance of documents and formal approach. And um, as both um, Clemens and Gwenelle stressed, um, rights issues and rights based approaches and indigenous people and communities will be part of um, heritage management in the future. And now we have the tools to do that, not just the desire. So as um, Ruhi challenged us, um, and thank you to all of you for that, for the three IBs for, from uh, Gwenelle, um, Clemens and, and Ruhi, telling that um, the key question is how we do the management. Do we put this uh, principle into practice? That will be the challenge for the, the years to come. And so with that, I will thank you everybody for contributing to this Earthies Thursdays, which will be available online after the event. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Benda, for, for, for all these these and, and particularly for pulling out these all these 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 good insights from everyone. I, I know I want to just very quickly thank the big audience and, and the organizers for, for inviting us all to, to be part of this. And finally, just to, to, to take a point that you said, Chrissy, had we done this meeting today, you know, when we started meeting in Oslo with you 10, 11 years ago, things would be different. What I, what I hear from today's session is that actually there is a need to sit down as, as, as we did uh, 11 years ago in Oslo and, and do this again and, and take this conversation forward. And, and, and in that sense, I can only you know, encourage uh, all the advisory bodies and the center to really you know, um, take that, this practical initiative forward, to take this agenda forward collectively. Um, clearly, we saw that there's a lot to learn from the grassroots initiatives, a lot to learn from the advisory bodies, the insights they have about the technicalities involved, a lot to learn also from the governments that, that are putting together these bids and so on. So in, in that sense, just a, a big warm thank you to everyone. And thanks again, Paulette. We're really um, your huge effort putting this together. I think it's been a very wonderful event and that hopefully will lead to much more. Thank you so much and goodbye, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the presentation.